Sunday. It is Easter and the day that we remember our risen Lord. We are in the auditorium, as you can see, in the sanctuary, and we moved from the office to try to uh, make it seem a little bit more like what we are used to on a Sunday morning. And I have to say that it is uh, weird to be in, in the room all by myself on Easter Sunday morning. But I trust that you're uh, watching and, and uh, doing your best to worship from your home as we are supposed to be doing at the moment uh, for uh, love of neighbor. And um, so we do what we can. Um, so I apologize for the, the, there is a bit of an echo because we're in a bigger room. And as, if we have to continue doing this for weeks, we will figure that out as we go along. But um, you should be able to uh, drown that out or that hopefully will become a background noise to you as we, uh, as we try to uh, make the best of what we have. A few announcements that I want to make sure that you have before we get going. Hopefully you enjoyed the music and you enjoyed some of the singing and you were able to do that with your family and uh, not, just, uh, not just listen to the piano but, but uh, sing along and sing the great truths of the resurrection. Of course, uh, some of the same announcements that we've been sharing, I want to make sure you have. If you, if you have the bulletin that was sent out on Remind, then you, you can follow along and you'll see all of these things. But I want to remind you that tonight uh, at 6, we will be also going uh, back into our world religions, uh, finishing the apologetics. Uh, the last, uh, this is like kind of part three of the last uh, session, uh, is finishing up on world religions. And so I hope that you've been uh, helped by that and, and able to learn a little bit about that. We're going to be uh, finishing that up tonight, and then next Sunday night we'll uh, begin something new. Uh, let me say we have quite a bit of birthday uh, wishes this week, so let me say happy birthday to Tim Sears and to Samuel Ferranto and to Gertie Koblenz and to Gerald Karras. Happy birthday to all of you this week. And then also two anniversaries to recognize, the Spinxes. And the all day. So happy anniversary to Maury and Mary Gail and Larry and Kathleen. Hope that you have uh, a great anniversary and I hope that uh, it, uh, you have many more years of uh, happiness together. So God bless you. Uh, again, uh, we mentioned last week that there's, there was a missions committee meeting scheduled for this week. I think you've probably figured it out, but we won't be having that. We'll po we're postponing that and we'll reschedule that for a later time and uh, we'll, we'll uh, take care of the business that we need to. And then the last one is just one that I want to make sure that uh, you know, and if I have to say it a lot of times, I, I will. I want to make sure that you know that if there's any way that we can help or pray for you, uh, contact us. We're doing our best to to talk, to contact you, but in the in the meanwhile, uh, in between those phone calls or or texts, if there's something that you need or uh, just uh, someone to talk to, someone to encourage you, someone to um, encourage you in one way or another, uh, let let someone know. Reach out to me. Reach out to one of the deacons, one of the, the church family. Um, we want to pray for you. One of the things that I hear a lot from people, as as they as I call them, are how's everyone else doing? Is there anyone that needs anything? And so there are uh, there are people that that really do care. And so you're not alone. We don't want you to feel like you're alone in this. And uh, maybe people who have are also dealing with kids, or uh, also getting used to a husband being around all the time, or uh, or a being or a husband being around all the time and not being able to. Do his normal routine. So there's all kinds of different uh, p uh, scenarios and, and ways that people are experiencing what we're going through right now. And so we want to we want to be a help to you if we can. And if and and if the only thing we can do uh, is to pray for you, then that's quite a bit, and that's really something. So we want to do what we can to help you with that. I want to read to you again from uh, the Valley of Vision, uh, my favorite little prayer book. I, I read this throughout the morning. Uh, b before I start my prayer time, and it's kind of like reading poetry. It's kind of like uh, getting yourself uh, just immersed in some in some really rich language and all of these uh, toward God. And so uh, I'll read this in a moment as we uh, consider Psalm 77. This being Resurrection Sunday, I wanted to read something that was similar to uh, that. It had a little bit to that, and I think that you'll recognize the tones of the resurrection in Psalm 77. 
beginning in verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Of course, this was sung by Israelites back in, in a day when they were the only ones who could call themselves the people of God. And today, uh, through the great uh, gospel of Christ, Gentiles can say uh, we have been redeemed by God's strong arm. So we come to worship this God who has done some wonderful things. And on this day, uh, throughout the calendar year, one of the greatest act uh, that God has done, um, I guess, I, I would think maybe the greatest act that God has done, uh, resurrecting from the dead, his son, Jesus Christ. So I read to you a, a portion of a prayer called Resurrection. And I, I think this is so appropriate and fitting for today. It says, Adorable Redeemer, thou who was lifted up upon a cross art ascended to highest heaven. Thou who was man of sorrows, was crowned with thorns, are now as Lord of life, wreathed with glory. Once no shame more deep than thine, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel. Now no exaltation more high, no life more glorious, no advocate more effective. Thou art in the triumph car leading captive thine enemies behind thee. What more could be done than thou hast done? Thy death is my life. Thy resurrection, my peace. Thy ascension, my hope. Thy prayers, my comfort. Let's go to our Lord this morning and pray and give him thanks and praise for the great things he has done for us. Father in heaven, we do give thanks that you have uh, triumphed over the grave and that uh, even now as we pray and as we commune with you, as we worship you on a, on a Sunday like this, we are confident that this is a risen Lord to whom we call. This is a living Savior to whom we pray. And we're thankful that we are not worshiping a memory. We are not just simply remembering uh, a life that was once lived and is now gone, but continues and is uh, very personal to us. So, Father, we're thankful and we praise you for the great things that you've done. Lord, there are many, many blessings that you have given to us that outnumber any of the prayers and the, and the requests that we could, that we could uh, uh, offer. And Father, this morning we re even recognize that we're, there's no way that we would be able to comprehend how deep your love is for us and how many things that you have done on our behalf. And so with a very uh, small grasp of what you have done, we say thank you. And with an eye to an empty grave this morning, we look and, and, and stand in awe and wonder and gratitude. For we recognize that it's not just part of a story, but it's the triumph, it's the victory of, of, a, of a Savior who gave his life for our sins. And now lives on our behalf as our advocate, as our intercessor, as our substitute. So Father, we thank you. This morning we have a reason to worship, we have a reason to be together, to, to lift up our, our voices and sing about it, to open up our Bibles and to listen to it and to read it aloud and to hear it taught ourselves. We pray this morning that you will help us as we worship. For I think for probably 100% of, of us, uh, we've never done Easter Sunday like this, and so we even ask for grace that we might be able to get past the un, the uncomfortableness or the awkwardness uh, of what we have kind of been forced to do, and may we be uh, just wrapped up and totally uh, captivated by the great God who rose from the dead and, and uh, in victory on our behalf. And so we pray that you will bless our time in your word and guide us and, and give us the grace that we need to not only hear, but believe and obey. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. 
I'm going to read to you from Matthew 28, as we, uh, as of course it's Easter Sunday, and so we want to read an Easter passage to get our minds fixed on what uh, what it is that we are we are to remember. Hopefully, this week you've had an opportunity to reflect on uh, not only the events of Easter Sunday, but the events that led up to it, the the, uh, the crucifixion on Friday, and I always think about on Saturday that. That, uh, that day of, of silence, of uh, the, the, the wide range of emotions that must have uh, been experienced by uh, the people who knew Christ. We think about the guilt and we think about the, the confusion and even the, the disappointment and, and the, of course the deep sorrow after losing a friend and a teacher. But the guilt of having betrayed that teacher, the guilt of having let him down in denying him as Peter did or as, as, uh, as uh, abandoning him as did his disciples, or of the, 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 the confusion of what, uh, what Jesus had promised and what they had thought was going to happen and now uh, was really, really ended in their minds. And for an entire Saturday, they sat in, in wonder. It was a Sabbath day of rest. But I imagine their minds were not very restful. We look forward to Saturday, on Saturday because we know that Sunday is going to be Easter. We know what that means. But Jesus had told them he would rise from the dead three days after he, re- he died. But they didn't really understand it. And so as we try to understand how uh, uncomfortable that Saturday would have been, we can then read about that Sunday and get a, a bit of a, a, a better understanding of what they must have must have felt like. So I read Matthew 28, and I'll read the first 10 verses of Matthew's resurrection account. It says, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. One of the little phrases that has popped up in my mind this, this year as I ponder the Easter story is the little phrase that the angel said, as he said. He is not here. He has risen, as he said, just like he promised. And my mind goes back to the different instances in Jesus' ministry when he promised the disciples, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, but I am going to rise again. I am going to live and as we recognize, uh, as we read these words from the scriptures, we recognize that the disciples didn't understand. They didn't really get what Jesus was talking about. But after the resurrection, they finally understood. And this is what the angel is saying. This, is, this, this shouldn't be a surprise to you. This is what he said he would do. And uh, then we think about even as Paul describes the gospel to us in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that, that Christ died according to the scriptures. And that he was raised according to the scriptures. It wasn't just as Jesus himself said, but as the entire scripture as a body uh, has said and and told us, the Messiah will not see corruption. He will die, he will rise again, and he will live. And so we're thankful that we have these words to to ponder and and to meditate upon. In this Easter this year, I hope that you will take some time today and think about what that means, what a resurrected Savior means.
This morning, I want to give you a few thoughts to help you along with that from the book of Romans. So if you'll go over, uh, take your Bible, if you're using a Bible this morning, and I hope that you are, and use, uh, go to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is a, a, uh, a, a passage that deals with, uh, it's, it's a middle of, of, obviously it's a middle chapter of, of uh, several chapters in, in Paul's letter to the Romans. But in these, these first few verses of chapter 6, we find that Paul speaks about uh, some, uh, the resurrection in a way that I think makes a lot of sense for us to consider today. And we'll get to that in just a moment. We're, we're mostly familiar, I think all of us are familiar with the story of Easter, with the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe, maybe not everybody knows all of the details, but for, for the most part, I think that most people know uh, what Easter is, is, is recognized for. Whether or not they believe the story, they know what, what is celebrated on that day. But I wonder if we've ever considered what that really means for us. What does the story of Easter mean? Why, why do we have that? What are the implications of Easter? We know that Easter happened. We know that the resurrection happened, that Jesus rose from the dead. And I think that most people would, could tell you what, it, what is meant by the resurrection or by Easter Sunday when, uh, when asked. But in this morning, instead of thinking about that it happened, that the resurrection happened, or uh, how the resurrection happened, I want us to consider why. Why did the resurrection happen? Namely, does the resurrection have any effect on our lives today? Does an event that happened over 2,000 years ago have any bearing on your life and on my life right now? Well, the Apostle Paul certainly thinks it does, as we'll see in just a moment. And it's really not a spoiler to say that the entire canon of Scripture uh, says that it does make a big difference. See, the resurrection is more than just a part of the narrative in Jesus' life. We, we all have a time when we're born, a time when we die, and then Jesus had a time when he resurrected. And it wasn't just a part of the story to kind of fill it in to make him different than the rest of us. Paul is explaining in Romans chapter 6 that the resurrection of Jesus has a huge impact on how we live our lives right here, right now. And so this morning, I want us to consider the fact that the death and the resurrection of Jesus doesn't just mean justification for the sinner. It doesn't just mean that we can be saved. But the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus also means sanctification for the Christian. And so we'll look at that in Romans chapter 6, and we'll, we'll consider the first 14 verses. Let's pray once more and ask the Lord to help us as we study His Word together. Father, we open our, eye, our eyes to Your words. We open our hearts to receive it. We pray that You will speak to us as only You can do. Lord, may we not just um, go through another, uh, another time in the Word and, and miss the truths that are there. May our eyes be open to truth. May our hearts believe it. And may we obey it and apply it. May we see the, the importance of these words. And really of all the words of scripture. Uh, in our lives as believers. And may those. Maybe someone who's hearing this. That is not yet uh, a Christian. We pray that you would use your word. To uh, shine the light of the gospel in their heart. That they might understand and believe and know the glorious truth and be changed by it just as we pray that we will. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, right from the very beginning of Paul's letter, at, in chapter 1, we read that Paul has the resurrection in mind. Now, the resurrection isn't primarily or the only thing that Paul is talking about. In fact, Paul is really going to talk about the gospel uh, as his as main main uh, argument or main purpose in the in the letter to the Romans. But uh, he does he, he incorporates the resurrection right away. Now, do you remember in Matthew four when the devil uh, was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? He said the statement, "If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread." And then a little bit later, he said. If you are the Son of God, then cast yourself down. He was on the, on, the, on the top of the temple, and he says, If you're the Son of God, 
cast yourself down. And what the devil was trying to do was tempt Jesus to prove who he really is. Well, Romans 1.4 tells us how Jesus proves who he really is. And it's not by turning stones into bread. It's not by jumping off of the temple and not dying. Paul says in Romans 1.4 that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God uh, in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So Paul is, is, is saying to us here that Jesus proved who he is by resurrecting from the dead. In fact, it says that he was declared to be the Son of God, which means it was said of him. And not just said of him, but said powerfully that he is the Son of God by his resurrection. Now, we want to make sure that we're not thinking that it's saying anything like he became the Son of God by his resurrection. He was already the Son of God. He was not made the Son of God because he was resurrected. He was declared to be the Son of God. And so Paul, right at the very beginning, wants us to understand that by the resurrection, who Jesus is has been clearly made known to us. We can look at Jesus and understand that he is the Son of God because of the event that happened on Easter Sunday. Now, as we continue to work through cha uh, until we get to chapter 6, there's a lot of, of things that are covered. And we're not going to try to take the time to understand all of those things. But maybe a 30,000 foot view would be helpful to get us to chapter 6. Uh, we want to understand how Paul is developing his, his thought here. In, be, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul begins to talk about uh, general or natural revelation and how God has revealed himself uh, through, his, through his creation and that uh, man has suppressed that knowledge. And, and chapters 1 and 2 really talk about, and even into chapter 3, about how man has, has rejected God and man has, uh, though he knew God, he didn't glorify him as God. And, and then we, 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 we read about God's wrath and his righteous judgment on our sin. We read that all are under sin, Jew and Gentile, whether you have the law or whether you don't, all are responsible to God for their sin. Then around chapter 3 and chapter 4, we begin to read about faith and having peace with God through Jesus Christ. The good news finally begins to take place. Then as we, as we get into chapter 5, we read about the theme of grace. Now, Paul has already mentioned grace a few times before uh, in the first four chapters of Romans. But now in chapter 5, he mentions it a half a dozen times, I think. Or at least five times he mentions the word grace. And he'll continue to talk about that into chapter 6. And one of the important things that Paul shows about grace is the nature, uh, is the nature of, its, uh, of its abundance. That it is abounding grace. And the verse that really... Uh, highlights that the clearest is in chapter 5 and verse 20. And so since we're at chapter 6 to study this morning, uh, it's easy to find back up into chapter 5 and read verse number 20. A familiar verse if you've been in church uh, for a while. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So where there was a lot of sin, an abundance of sin, grace was present in more and more abundance in even greater amounts and this is what paul is talking about how wonderful grace is that it that even though our sin is is, is at its height it's a, it, it's 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 insurmountable even for grace it pales in comparison grace abounded even more and now, as Paul has been talking about grace, and when we get into chapter 6, he is anticipating a question that comes from thinking about abounding grace. Where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. He anticipates a question right away as we get into chapter 6. He says there, uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? It's the person who would say, well, if, if there's a lot of sin and, and every time there's a lot of sin, there's a lot more grace, then let's make more sin so that there will be even more grace, which would be an abuse of grace. And notice how Paul answers this. He says in verse number at the end of verse or the beginning of verse number two, by no means or God forbid or absolutely not. Of course not. We should not sin 
so that grace may abound or or live in sin continue in sin that grace may abound literally the words there are may it never be may it never be so that people who have been uh, redeemed who have been uh, brought into relationship with God continue to live in sin and that's even how Paul asks the question here how shall we who are dead to sin how can we who died to sin still live in it uh, in fact, he's saying, how could we do this? It's not necessarily a question of desire, like why would you do it, but a question of an ability, like how could this even be possible? How can someone who is dead to sin continue to live in it? And this is what Paul is, is, is really going to be talking about for the next several verses, on even in, for the next uh, chapter or two. But what Paul has already ex, uh, ex, expounded to us in verses 1 and 2, now he explains to us in the next several verses that we will look at. Namely, that Christians are not to continue living in sin or to be ruled by it. And, and here's where the resurrection ties in with this, the resurrection of Christ is that which makes it possible for us to no longer live and, and be controlled by sin. So we're not supposed to sin. And it's because Jesus rose from the dead that we don't have to sin, that we are no longer controlled or bound by sin. And so we're going to read this passage together, and I, I want you, invite you to read it with me and, and follow and see where we're going. And as we're reading it, let me give you a couple of things to be looking for. First of all, uh, we're going to see several indicatives, several statements of facts. I'll, I'll point them out, four of them, uh, that really will build upon one another as we go. Uh, then we will see, following these indicative or, st or statements, we'll see imperatives or commands. We'll see several commands uh, given to us in light of what we have already been said. So the indicative command says, here's the truth, and the Excuse me, and the imperative command says, now do this based on the truth. And so overall, I want you to see that the Bible teaches us that the resurrection of Christ means sanctification for the believer. In other words, because Jesus rose from the dead, those of us who are in Christ are now dead to sin, free from bondage, and able to live new lives unto God for his glory. So Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Listen to God's word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death has no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace." So we look at these indicative statements first to understand what Paul is saying to us, these statements of truth. And I have them in four, uh, four different statements, and we'll go through them uh, briefly so that we can understand what Paul is, is building there uh, so that we can get to the commands uh, of what, what, we're, what we're understanding the implications of the resurrection for us. 
The first statement, the first indicative statement that Paul gives to us are in ver is in verses 3 and 4. Baptism into Christ means union with him in death. Baptism in Christ means union with Christ in death. Notice in verse number 3 how he starts off his explanation of the answer he gives to this really, really crazy question about living in sin uh, after, after being in Christ. And he says, don't you know? Don't you know that uh, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? It's an important phrase here, don't you know or do you not know, because it implies that there's something you should know. You should know something about what, what we're talking about here, Paul says. And really, it, it, it highlights the fact that there are several important doctrines that every Christian needs to understand. Now, some of these truths or doctrines we, we could consider elementary. They're very beginner doctrines, and they're very, they're very basic, but they're very, very vital and important. And we never really leave those things, but we build upon them. And then there are others that would be considered advanced, and, and maybe, the, and I don't know where you are particularly in, in your knowledge and in your understanding of the Scriptures, but our knowledge, which should always be growing, will affect how we live on a daily basis. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Uh, if you're going to ask that type of a question about living a certain way, it comes back to the fact that don't you know? Don't you know certain things about the scriptures and about the doctrine of Christ? And so let's let's listen a little bit closer and hear how he develops this statement. He says, and we see in verse number three also that being saved means being united with Christ. And that's how he talks about using this language about being baptized into Christ Jesus. Now, the, youth, the New Testament uses the phrase in Christ quite a bit to describe what it means to be justified or to be saved. Uh, a very clear example of that is found in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. It says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And here this baptism into Christ is an association with Christ. It's a union with Christ. And it talks about here, as we think about baptism, it talks about someone who is immersed or who is covered with Christ, like putting on the garment. We'll see that even that language uh, in a little bit in a little bit from now. But so being saved, he's saying, is like being being if you're if you're a Christian, if you're justified if baptized into Christ, Paul's saying, if you're that, then you're also that means that you are united with Christ in death. And that's what he's saying there in verse number three, that union with Christ means being united with Christ in death. Therefore, verse number four, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Paul's saying here in the beginning of verse number three that if you're baptized into Christ, that means you were baptized into death. And the following step after, after death is burial. And so he goes into the, then we were buried with him uh, through this, uh, this baptism. Now, baptism is that symbol by which we are buried with Christ. We're not literally buried as Christ was literally buried. Uh, I like what one scholar put it. He said, burial sets the seal on death. So the Christian's baptism is a token burial in which the old order of life in sin comes to an end, to be replaced by the new order of life in Christ. So the first uh, indicative, the first statement we need to understand that Paul says here is that baptism into Christ means union with him in death. Now they build. We look at the next half of verse 4. Union with Christ in death means union with him in life. Union in his death equates with union in his life or union in the resurrection. Look at verse number four again, the second half. It says we were, uh, well, we, we'll, we'll read the whole thing. We were buried therefore with him. Uh, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that or so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we were buried with Christ so that we also might have new life. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we who are dead and buried with him are raised to new life. 
Jesus was raised by the glory of the Father in verse number 4, and we also who are dead and buried with him are raised to life again. The third statement is in verses 6 and 7. Union with Christ in death means death to sin and freedom from its bondage. Now, I didn't read verse number 5 uh, uh, just a minute ago, so I'll begin there so that you can hear the, 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 the building, the progressive uh, building of his statements here. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So union with Christ not only means union with him in life, but it means that we are dead to sin and free from its bondage. Once again, we are told of something that we know. And again, it's important to recognize that there, uh, this, uh, this must be an important truth that we should know or that we know and we need to remember. That uh, our old man, our old self, was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be done away with or might be abolished. Now, this is the old self that Paul later calls the body of this death in chapter 7. He says, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I, 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 I want to do these right things, but I'm, I find myself doing the wrong things. And it's, it's the war that's raging inside of not only him, but inside of every true believer. Paul desires to be freed from sinful actions. And, no lo and, and he recognized that though he's no longer ruled by sin, there, there is a war within him. And he finds himself doing sin, even though he doesn't want to. Ephesians 4.22 says that the old self uh, belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And this is the old self, the old man, if you will, that has been uh, crucified with Christ. And we see that the purpose of this death in verse number 6 is so that we'll no longer be enslaved to sin. Because death means the freedom of from who, whatever service you are in. And so then it says here that, uh, the, 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 in verse number six, that the, uh, the old self would be, uh, or the body of sin, might be brought to nothing. It's an interesting word there. It, it means to be destroyed. It means to be done away with or abolished or made powerless. And what, is, and what is being explained to us here is that because of the, the death in Christ and the union with, union with him and then the union with him in resurrection, we are free from the power of sin. Now, it's not saying that we're free from the presence of sin, as, as we see later on in chapter 7, is that we continue to deal with our sin, but we are free from its bondage. It doesn't mean that we'll never struggle with it again. It doesn't mean that all of the sinful natures and patterns in our lives are going to fall away quickly or easily. It does mean that a change has occurred. If you're in Christ, old things are passed away, all things are becoming new. Before we are in Christ, we were the slaves of sin. Chapter 6 and verse 17. And it was our master, it was our Lord. We obeyed its commands and we lived for its desires. We were controlled by it. But death brought an end to that bondage. And that's what Paul is getting at, that when we died with Christ and the old man was crucified with Christ, we're no longer under the bondage of sin. It's no longer our master. And that brings us to the last statement. Union with Christ in his death means union with him in life to God. Dead to sin, alive to God. And we see that in verses 8 and, and continuing. It says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe we also live with him. We know, again, something that we should know, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So if we're in Christ and we've died with Christ, then just as Christ was raised to life, so we will also. Because we know that Christ is not going to die again because he's resurrected. 
Jesus resurrected, it wasn't just a reset, it wasn't a restart, backing a few days up before he would die again. The fact that he resurrected from the dead means that he conquered death and never will succumb to its power. And, uh, it's, and therefore, it can no longer rule over him. It holds no power over him. And since Jesus died to sin, verse 10 says that he now lives to God. In the same way, we are dead to sin, and we are alive to God. We're not just given a new life for the sake of having a new life, a chance to try again or a chance to live again. We have been brought back to life, not to be free to ourselves, but to be free from sin and now alive to God. And that's, what, that's how verse number 11 it finishes there. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. We've been freed from something to another thing. We're not just wandering around uh, without, uh, with, with, without a master, if you will. And this is, what, well, this is what Paul wants us to understand. That, that we are not just dead to sin, but alive to God. We are no longer serving sin. We're no longer serving ourselves. We are doing that which God created us to do, which is to live for Him. And this is important because too many people believe that grace frees them to do whatever they want. It frees them and allows them to live however they want. But truly, grace frees us from sin to God, from death to life. And that's what, if we would continue into verses 15 and on to the next chapter, we would see that further explained. But Paul has laid some groundwork for us now, explaining who we are in Christ and our position with him, what it's like to be united with him, both in death and in life. And then he continues then, and this is how we'll finish, with a few commands based on these realities. So I'll give you three. The first one uh, is, is there uh, throughout, but the second two are, are much more obvious. The first one, uh, what must we do based on these truths? And the first one, well, it starts with what we know. We must know the truth of Christ's life and death. Not the fact that he lived and died, but what those truths mean. We must have an understanding of what they mean. It starts with what you know. And that's why three times he has talked about what we know. If you don't know, how are you going to grow? You have to learn. And it's important and even crucial that Christians learn doctrine and learn what it means uh, when, the, when the scriptures say we are in Christ or when we are baptized into Christ or, or all of the many truths that are found in the pages of scripture, which means it's so important that we read the word and we study the word and we listen to it taught and, and that we who teach it, teach it clearly and, and carefully because it's, uh, the, the knowledge of the Christian is vital for, uh, to his growth. Uh, we must learn the truth of Christ's life and his death and what it means for us. We need to understand that Jesus lived and died and rose again for more than just to take you to heaven. The purpose of Jesus' life and death and resurrection was more than just so you could be forgiven of your sins or go to heaven when you die. It's about living today unto God for his purpose, for his glory, and by his spirit. So first of all, know the truth of Christ's life and death. Secondly, in verse 11, we read it already, you must consider yourselves dead to sin. Once you know, then it's a mindset. Now you've got a new perspective. You've got a new way to look at life. Uh, consider yourselves dead to sin. And this kind of goes back to how he started in verse number two. How can we live in sin if, or continue to live in it if we were dead to it? And that's why he finishes it in verse 11 there. Hey, consider yourself dead to sin. Wake up in the morning and consider yourself no longer under the slavery and bondage of sin. You're dead to it. And consider yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus. As a new lifer, if you will, consider yourself the, the, no longer the slave to sin, but alive to God. And it means that we need to actively resist the, 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 the control of sin in our bodies. The, the body of, of this death, the body of sin, the old man, is not completely done away with yet. And he's not going out quietly. He's, 
kicking and fighting and screaming all of the way, and he, every day, will try to take over and, 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 and use our bodies for its own purposes, for sinful desires and for temptations and for sin and, 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 our, own, and our own wickedness. And that's the third statement then, the, the imperative that we see here in verses 12 to 14. Present yourselves to God or present yourselves as a living sacrifice. In verse number 12, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your, in your mortal body. Don't let it control you. Why? Because you're dead to it. It doesn't have a claim on you and have a right to, to, to lord over you. And, and notice how it will reign in your mortal body by making you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So uh, don't let sin reign over you by making you obey its passions. It's no longer your master. You've been freed. You have a new master. Verse 16 tells us that we are the slaves of whomever or whatever we obey. And so if we are obeying our sinful passions, it shows that we are allowing it. It, it either really is our master or we have a very weird uh, relationship with our sin. And uh, we have one master and we're trying to serve another. Don't present yourselves to sin like a dutiful servant showing up to serve his master. He's not your master. Don't let him rule over you and don't voluntarily submit to him either. And don't present your body members as instruments of unrighteousness. He's saying the same thing, but in a, in a little bit different way to, to think about the different parts of your body, your eyes and your ears and your, and your mind and your heart and your feet and your hands. Don't present them as instruments, as tools to work unrighteousness. Instead, present yourself to God, your new master. As someone who is alive in him, through him, and for him. Verse number 13. Present your body members, your body parts, as instruments for righteousness. Now, if you're, in, if you're, if you're familiar with, this, with the language that Paul is using, you might be uh, re reminded of uh, another place where Paul talks about presenting yourself to God. And, and it's in Romans as well, and it's in chapter 12. It says that uh, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Once we understand what new life in Christ means, we must actively and intentionally present ourselves to God as these living sacrifices. Sacrifices that are alive unto God. And, and it goes on to say that this is how we worship. This is your spiritual worship. Now, just if, to, if you want to continue to read through chapter 6, you get an understanding of how he continues to develop this thought. Uh, they continue the theme of being freed from the power of sin and presenting ourselves to God with, with even uh, stark, uh, starker language. Let me just read how it ends in chapter 6 in verse number 19. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And this is why I say that the resurrection of Christ means the sanctification for the believer. Because we have been freed from sin, we have been given new life in Christ to God, and as we live and present ourselves as instruments of righteousness to God, it yields sanctification in the believer's life. So to answer our question from the very beginning of the chapter, should we continue in sin in order to make grace even more abundant? Well, the answer is clear. How could we do that? We are dead to it. We have a new life in Christ. Instead, we must learn what it means to be in Christ. We must renew our minds each day to live as truly dead to sin and alive to God. And we must daily present ourselves to our new Lord and our new Master, who is our Heavenly Father, who sent His Son to suffer and to die for our sins.
who raised him to life three days later so that through his death and resurrection we might have forgiveness of sins but newness of life as well. This is what the resurrection means for the Christian. It means having new life today. Not just eternal life one day, but new life today, right now, as you live and breathe right here. Not only new life for the one who walked out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, but for all who are united with him by faith. It means sanctification, living unto God in ways that honor him and bring him glory. If you're a Christian, that means that you have been crucified with Christ. As Paul says in Philippians, I've been crucified with Christ. I, I, I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. In the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're a believer in Christ this morning, know that you are alive for a purpose, for a reason that Christ has redeemed you so that you might live for his purposes. And if you've never trusted in Christ as the Savior of your soul, the Bible teaches us that he is the only way to find this new life. We read very carefully in the, in the letter to the Romans, Paul says that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses and that we stand under the wrath of God. We are condemned, Jesus said, in John 3, we are condemned already. And yet, when we turn to Christ, we find in him a perfect Savior, a sufficient Savior, one who, uh, whose death will atone for our sins, will appease the wrath of God. The Bible calls him our propitiation. And when we turn to him, we find in him not only forgiveness of our sins, but new life. One day we'll live forever with him in heaven. But today, you can have new life. And you can be redeemed and no longer controlled by the sin that we, we, are, we are controlled by until we come to Christ. If we will only turn to him. This is what the resurrection means. It means new life for us. It means sanctification unto God. In ways and, and helps us to live in ways that honor him and bring him glory. Why don't we pray together? Father, we do ask that you will seal your words in our hearts, write them on our hearts, teach, the, teach us what they would, what they would mean and, and how they would apply into our lives. We pray that uh, the Holy Spirit who indwells each believer would uh, continue to uh, teach us the truths of your word. I pray that you would help us to see in, in very clear and practical ways how these words and these truths uh, would, would apply to us. Lord, I pray as, as well for anyone who is maybe listening that is not a believer, that is not a Christian. They, have, they don't have this new life. They've never been baptized into Christ. They've never been united with him in death and in new life. We pray that they would that the, the light of the gospel would shine in their hearts, that they would turn to you, they would repent, that they would believe the glorious gospel, and that they might uh, know this life that we talk about, that this Easter Sunday would be uh, a very different one for them because on this day they found new life themselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so may the grace of God of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May God bless you this Easter Sunday. God be with you.